So today I'll present our paper uh, in information flow interfaces. Uh, this paper was um, uh, co-authored by Ezio Bartocci, my supervisor, uh, Thomas Ferrer, Thomas Enzinger, and Diane Nikovic. Um, okay, and in this, uh, the main motivation for this paper was to um, develop a formalism to have um, a way to have composition, compositional um, design of security requirements that can be uh, specified as information flow properties. Okay, and so first I will start to explain why information flow and actually why it's challenging to address information flow in general. So first, as I already mentioned, so security policies can be enforced by restricting the flow of information. Um, for example, we have here an example uh, where uh, if you want to start the engine of your car, usually, usually you have an immobilizer in the car key, for example, uh, and this immobilizer shares the secret key with the engine. And through this secret key, they do uh, authentication protocol, and if it's successful, the engine will start. And um, the, the property we are interested in is that the key that secret should not leak to somebody to some other entity that's not the engine and the immobilizer because that could lead to a car theft. And this is an example of a confidentiality property. So in our example, we are talking about uh, authentication protocol between the immobilizer and the uh, uh, engine. And the idea is that the property we want to enforce is that the secret key must not flow to the debug port. And we have here an example, what we could call a direct flow, where the information in the mobilizer is flowing through the CAN bus to a debug port uh, directly. Or we can have a more complicated flow uh, where the information actually goes through the engine and then is the engine somehow responsible to um, get the information out through the CAN bus. But information flow is not only for confidentiality properties, uh, we can actually encode integrity properties. For example, here we have a shared bus um, that's connecting uh, to, to, to um, that's connecting, um, that's or better, it's allowing uh, two functionalities. One is that the distance warners that tells you how far you are from an object can, can communicate with the braking system to allow the safe braking of the, the car. While on the other side, we have the wheel tick that counts how many rotations on the wheel, uh, use the same bus to communicate with the odometer that tells you how far you went so far. And now the point is, of course, you have this shared bus, but the, the, the functionality of the distance warners and the braking system um, should have higher integrity. So we should be careful because it's, a safety critical component. So we have this shared communication between a safety critical component and there is something that's not safety critical that's using the same bus. And the property that we want to enforce is that the information that comes from the wheel sensor should not interfere with the braking system. Because if this is the case, the braking system may, may miss some information from the distance warners, and that may lead to a malfunctioning of this safety critical property. And this example that's actually in the paper, um, the previous one is in the extended version of the, of the paper. Uh, we, we got it from this paper from Marcus, Nikok, and all uh, called information flow analysis of combined simulic and state flow models, where they provide a way to verify this. Um, but in our formalism, what we are interested in is a way to design the system in a compositional manner so that we can distribute the responsibilities of who enforces this flow. Okay, so what are the challenges we face when we look at information flow? So first, they are relational properties. So we need to somehow compare input and output ports. So we have these input-output relations. What this means that if you want to do compositional thinking, uh, it becomes rather complex. Then on top of this, they are, they are what we call hyper properties. Because if what happens is that secret information can be inferred by relating multiple observations of the system. So this means that looking at one system execution is not enough. 
uh, we need to reason with respect to sets of executions and compare them. Uh, on top of these, we need to be careful about side, side channels like power consumption and computational time. And finally, we have a problem with refinement. So what happens is that specification of information flow may not be closed under refinement. So, and as I said before, for hyper properties, um, secret information can be inferred by relating these multiple observations of the system. So non-determinism can help us to hide uh, secret information. And if somehow through refinement, we remove this non-determinism, then it may be easier to infer a secret. And all these uh, four uh, properties of information flow make it really challenging to do any kind of compositional reasoning with it. Okay, and now we look, okay, so we know why it's important, we know why it's challenging. So what kind of, um, how can we specify information flow? So there is many semantic definitions because they will depend on um, how much restrictive you want the policy to be. So, and this means how much you want to affect the overall functionality to ensure security uh, besides other, other considerations. So there is many, many de semantic definitions, but here we will focus on what we call the structural view of information flow. And I was kind of hinting at it uh, in the uh, pictures above. So basically what we want to do is to reason with respect, respect to these flow relations. Uh, and a flow relation will tell us that there is a flow from A to B, right? And this relation is to be reflexive and transitive. So it's some sort of reachability. You are asking, can I from A reach to B? But then our uh, specification will actually be in terms of no flow relations. Um, and in this case, we only won't require that's an irreflexive relation. And from now on, or for most of our, for most of my presentation, uh, I will focus in the structural view because that's uh, what this paper uh, focused on. Um, and we are, again, so we are presenting an interface theory for the structural view of information flow. Okay, and as many of you will know, so whenever we want to design a system, we want to design a secure system, we need to consider many things, especially when we are dealing with systems like, op op like cars. So we'll need to deal with uh, multiple architectural layers. Uh, so maybe subsystems will be developed by different teams or even by a different company. Uh, we'll have heterogeneous components that require different languages, uh, for example. And on top of that, because we are talking about information flow, we need to take into account the interaction between the cyber and the physical components, because it's possible to infer secret information by um, looking, as I said, to the power consumption. Luckily, we kind of know how to deal with many of these aspects. So, and, and that's what we thought. So let's try to apply this contract-based design approach to this problem. And in particular, we, we formalized it with the interface. So interface theory as introduced by Luca Del Faro and Thomas Enzinger in 2001. So basically what we have, so we have interfaces, that's our models. Um, and then we have to define two relations and one operation that I will explain next. So first we need a notion of composition. So we need to know if we have an interface F1 and an interface F2, what's the result of composing both of them? And uh, in our case, we assume that any two interfaces can be composed. So on top of these, we need a compatibility relation that basically tells us uh, when I compose two interfaces, do I get a well-formed or a well-defined interface as a result? And finally, the, the, the other relation is refinement. So basically, uh, we want to know if I, if, if I have one interface, does it refine the, the other interface? For example, in this example here, if we look at the composition of one F11, F12, and F13, is it the refinement of our original interface F1? So this is the structure, but then we need to satisfy two axioms. So the first one, incremental design, uh, uh, tell us that 
the composition of different system parts um, should be possible without requiring additional knowledge of the system. And if you look at the picture, this is the same as before. So this means that, for example, if I want to compose F11 with F12, I should be able to do it without any knowledge about F13. And this can be formalized like this. So basically we are saying that if I know that F is compatible with J and all of these are interfaces, and then I compose them, and then I, with that composition, I check whether they are compatible with H, then actually I could do the order of these operations in a diff So these operations could be done in a different order. Um, and the, the second axiom is independent implementability. And this means that we can do uh, independent refinement of subsystems. And that's what you see already here in the picture. So here the point is that if I had F1 and F2, then I can give F1 to one team and F2 to a different team, and they can keep refine, refining their uh, interfaces independently. And at the end, when I get after all the refinement, when I do composition, so when I do bottom up again, I will guarantee the initial um, specification. And here is the um, uh, formalization. So it means that you no know, refinement will not interfere with the uh, composition. Okay. So now I will present um, examples first, and then I will explain in more detail what's happening. So this is the first example from confidentiality, where we see that the key should not flow to can and deb. And these will be the, the specification for the closed system. Then our team, imagine, uh, wants to uh, refine this, want to split the work through different teams. And for example, it comes with these splits where the key is uh, actually will be a third party, while the can, our bus, will be a third party as well. And then the F team in the middle is what my team or the team uh, will be responsible to implement. So they do a first decomposition and they just um, keep that. So it's an assumption because it's on, on the outside, but we'll look at this in more detail. They keep this assumption that key does not fly to, does not flow to can. And now our um, no flows are with these dashed arrows. However, our, what our um, theory, our framework will say is that actually this decomposition, uh, when I compose it together, will not satisfy the original F interface. So we say, this is not well-formed, this is not okay. So then the team will refine their initial decomposition, for example, RDs, adding guarantees in their implementation. And then the, the the composition can go for, for, uh, further, you know, there will be the engine component and there will be the mobilizer component. And finally, you know, they will be implemented. Um, finally, so um, we will go from the interfaces with the dashed arrows that are no flows into the components at the bottom where there is the full line arrows. Okay, and now for the integrity for the second example, uh, we have that the wheel should not flow to the Warner's uh, target. So the T is for targets. Um, and there is again a first decomposition, but will not be, uh, our, our framework will say, this is not okay. Um, and then they do further uh, decomposition. And then the interesting thing is that uh, we can then use actually, for example, what uh, Marcos Mikog and the others um, developed, the tool they developed to check whether the implementation um, actually satisfies our interface requirements. Okay, and now we'll look at the details how uh, our framework is helping the designers in this process. Okay, so we'll start with the stateless case. And the stateless case means that um, the specification does not change through time. So stateless is with respect to the specification. So we have disjoint sets of input and output variables. So the input we call X and output Y. Uh, then we have no flow constraints on the environment that we call assumptions. 
and they are in blue in this. So the assumption will point to input variables. And we have no flow requirements on implementations that are called guarantees, and they will point to uh, output variables. And in this case, they are inside of the interface bus that we can see there. And now, of course, the first question is, we are defining no flows, but how do we relate these no flows to the components? And because the component tells us which flows were implemented. And we have here an example. And for example, we have two distinct uh, implementations of the bus interface. For example, our bus can have a flow from the wheel tick to the odometer, because if you look at the interface above, uh, there is no guarantee saying that that flow is not allowed, right? So we only have two guarantees that say that the wheel tick cannot flow to the Warner front back targets. And in the other case, we have the other meter flowing to the Warner uh, front um, target. Now, the interesting thing is these two implementations are allowed separately, but when we, if we had an implementation with both of these flows, uh, this is not allowed because, and I was just remember, flows are transitively close. So this means that if in an implementation we have a flow from the wheel tick to the odometer, and then from the wheel odometer to the Warner front targets, actually we have a flow from the wheel tick to the Warner front target, and that's forbidden by our guarantee in the top, in the interface. And this feature is very important because, because we have these transitive, transitively closed flows, it means that so there is no component that's somehow maximal. There is no component that includes all possible implementable flows because of this feature. And this will become important later. So just keep it in mind. And now I think maybe you already guessed. So how do we actually uh, compose or how do we know how to compose the interfaces? And in this case, what we use is the notion of shared variable. So in this case, we have that im for immobilizer in the uh, interface fim is an output port, while it is an input port of the interface fcan. So this means that when we will try to compose these interfaces, we will use this, notion, this shared variable im to do the composition like this, right? So that's how we will connect these two interfaces. And you can see here the result. Then in addition, so these shared variables will become output variables of the composed interface. You can look at it as they were used already, the input. Okay. And now, um, as I said, the whole point of this is such that we can have, for example, as we had in the example, say that the wheel tick should not flow to the braking system. And the whole point is that we can split responsibilities of who is who should enforce this flow. But as you can see here, this flow is going across both implementations of the bus and environment of the bus. So how do we split the responsibility to enforce this no flow? And the truth is, the bus itself by itself alone cannot do it. So what we, we introduced in our interfaces was this notion of property. And this property will specify what we call system-wide requirements. And then we use it to um, be sure that um, our, our interfaces have enough assumptions and guarantees to enforce this property. But now the important thing is this property is only used to check the well-formedness. So how, how that our interfaces are actually well-defined, uh, but they can be ignored once we go to the implementation side, because then only guarantees are important. But for all the process, the top, bottom, and the bottom up of the uh, design system, they are just used as, a, as guides to guarantee the well-formedness of the interfaces. And now we can look at what is an interface. So basically it's a tuple <laughs> where we have the input ports, the output ports, 
assumptions, guarantees, and property. And they will be all no-flow relations, the assumptions, guarantees, and properties. And on top of that, so we need to you know, guarantee that the assumptions and guarantees together can uh, enforce the property. So we have this idea that the property is consistent. Um, I will explain this operator next, but the idea of this operator is that if I pick any implementation that's allowed by the assumptions and I compose it with any implementation that's allowed by the guarantees, I'm sure to not uh, violate one of the properties. And now I will explain the operator. Um, so to, to do this reasoning, I was saying, we need to reason about all the flows in the composition of two interfaces. And as I said before, there is no maximal implement implementation. So there is no implementation that subsumes all the other implementations. So we need to uh, be careful when defining this notion of all the flows in the composition of two interfaces. So what we need to do is we need to, a flow can be characterized by a path through two implementations, for example, and we need to guarantee that this path is such that each step is in a different interface. So you are basically alternating between interfaces. So, and this is the, this notion. So we have two no-flow relations, can be assumptions, can be guarantees. Um, and then just look here at the middle. What we do is that, so there is this, we want to form this path where one step comes from things that are in the complement of the no-flow prime. So it can be implemented by some, uh, can, be, can be in some implementation, followed by a flow that's in the complement of the no-flow. So you are picking a flow from each of these no-flows. <laughs> and that's how you, 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 um, you check all the flows in the composition of two interfaces. And this is used in minor parts of our theory, is used to check for consistency of interfaces and is used during the composition as well of interfaces. Okay. And now um, we, are, we have almost all ingredients for the stateless. So now we, you actually need to um, say, uh, when are two interfaces compatible for composition? And this means when I compose them together, um, I will get a well-formed interface. So the idea is that if an interface is providing inputs to another interface, for example, sending is providing inputs to the bus, then sending must include guarantees that imply the assumptions of the bus. And in this case, you see, so the bus needs that the wheel tick does not flow as an assumption to the Warner back source and the sending as that guarantee. And that's why this composition will be well-formed. Yeah, so first, of course, they need to be what we call composable, so we cannot have the same output ports. And then what we need to look at is all the assumptions that will somehow um, not be in the composition anymore, because we are talking about these shared variables that will become output ports. All these assumptions will need to be covered by the guarantees of, of the other interface. And this is how we define the compatibility. And now, um, so what we do during composition is that we are actually allowed to add assumptions on the composed interface whenever necessary. But <laughs> we need to be careful because um, while we can add these kind of uh, these assumptions that, that are actually needed, we still need to guarantee incremental design. And incremental design tells us that we can do composition in basically almost any order. So what, how do we solve this problem is that uh, we propagate assumptions only, the assumptions that are not yet fully guaranteed. And here in an example, there is an assumption there from key to can. But what will happen here is that key will stay an input port of the composition, while can, because the shared variable, so can is in both interfaces, will become an output port. So what happens is that this key to can can no longer be um, an assumption 
of the composed interface and it cannot be a guarantee. Uh, it will be a guarantee, but that's not enough. Because again, because flows are transitively closed, we still need to forbid flows from the environment. So what we do is, so here is um, the result is that we observe that uh, the ECU that will be an input port of the compost uh, can flow to can. And because of that, we will forbid the environment to connect the key to the ECU. Okay, and, and here is how we compose, how we compute them. So we need to look at the shared variables. So that's this S, so our variables that are input on one side and output on the other. Then if there is an assumption that's pointing to a shared variable and that is uh, what we call a flow in the composition that's putting, uh, pointing to the shared variable, we will be sure to add an assumption that for these, these two things to get connected. And so, and this was the stateless, uh, but another thing we presented in that paper or introduced in that paper are stateful uh, information flow interfaces. And these um, interfaces allow the specification to, sh to change over time. For example, in this example, we are saying that X cannot flow to Y until X cannot flow to Z. Um, and what we did is that we have transition systems and in each state, we have a stateless interface. And then composition and refinements are defined using the notion of product and alternating refinement. So actually the, the kind of most difficult part was the stateless. And then from then on, we just applied very standard um, operators for the composition and refinement for the stateful case. Okay. So, and up to here is basically what was in the paper, but now I want to give a bit of a teaser for what's to come. So what about trace semantics? So everything I was talking here was no flows, flow, structural information flow. So the first thing is that the, the interface as it is right now already supports as some very simple support to trace semantics because you can instantiate this uh, no flows or the flows at the level of the component with any tool that already does this kind of analysis, right? So theoretically you could have, you know, you could decompose and you can then you can have 10 components and for each component use possibly a different notion of flow. But of course, this may not be very satisfying, but you can already do this. But now we, the interesting thing is, can we actually give a more interesting trace semantics to this? So up to now, uh, our uh, language-based techniques have been proved very useful and very powerful to enforce information flow policies. The main problem is that they are attached to a language. And when we are talking about heterogeneous systems, cyber physical systems, this does not really necessarily uh, fit the bill. Um, more recently, uh, it was introduced uh, hyper logics uh, and these logics uh, extend uh, temporal logics with quantification over trace, traces, and they can specify information flow policies. Of course, these logics have mostly been focused on model checking and closed systems, but still we were curious, can we somehow pick the most popular of these logics and use in our setting? And this is a paper that my co-authors and, and me published in the beginning of this year called Flavors of Sequential Information Flow, where we actually uh, show that, you know, specification of information flow policies using these hyperlogics is highly influenced by just assumptions our system is observed. So you really need to be, to know a lot about how we are going to implement the system to be able to specify this property. And that may not be available at design time. So in a way, the answer is kind of no, the hyperlogics that we have now are not yet there. And, the, but this opens a lot of future work, right? So can we come up with other hyper temporal logics that will help us uh, specify uh, information flow that allows this compositional reasoning. Okay, so just to summarize, 
Um, so in the paper, we define for both the stateless and the stateful case, this notion of well-formedness criteria for interfaces. So introduce this notion of property that allow us or allow the designer to decide um, where to put the responsibility to, to specify a flow so it can balance between assumptions and guarantees. Uh, we define what, what is an implementation with respect. So what, when a component implements an interface, of course, we define the composition and the compatibility, but then the most important thing is that we prove that our framework satisfies both incremental design and independent implementability. And as future work, of course, will be to extend with trace semantics. So to allow to tailor semantics and to reason more natively with these trace semantics. And this is all, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Are there questions? Panayotis, you raised your hand. Yes, thank you very much, Dejan. Thank you, Anna, for the nice presentation. And congratulations to you and your supervisors for this very nice work and uh, the best paper award. Um, first, I would like to make a question for clarifying my understanding. As far as I understood, uh, you initially focused on uh, stateless um, interfaces and then uh, you presented just one slide for stateful interfaces. Do you mean that in this latter case you can take also into account uh, behavior for the composed components? I mean uh, state transition behavior. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. We, we define the composition and the refinement for the stateful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. The second question is, uh, uh, this is a very nice work that uh, mainly focuses how to build systems mm -hmm. by uh, preserving some uh, nice properties uh, for component-based uh, development, like incrementality and so on. So it is basically a, a work that focuses on how to structure the systems exactly. in terms of components. Um, do you see any prospect to extend this work in the future or you or Dejan, I don't know, maybe can answer this question to the direction of uh, defining uh, information flow policies using labels, for example, uh, to assign labels in the component ports. Uh, because I think this would be a good prospect towards uh, making this approach uh, more practically applicable in building real systems. Okay, so just to be uh, just to be sure I understood you. So you are meaning the security labels, like the security labels. Like, uh, right? Yes, yes. I have in mind, uh, for example, the related work by Myers and Liskov, which is on. Uh, uh, decentralized label model. It is a quite old paper mm -hmm. published in ACM Transactions on Software Engineering in 2000. So the interesting, or the way I see this, um, so the point is when you, at least as far as I know, when you uh, define a security lattice, you define this notion of wh where it can flow. Yes. Right. Um, so the interesting thing, because we look at no flows, Right, so you yeah. can uh, organize your system and then at the um, component level, you can say, oh, and this now is my security lattice. Does my security lattice implement this no flow interface? I'm not sure if you see. So because they are, uh, uh, because they are flows, right? Mm -hmm. So they are at the component level for us. And then the interesting part is because we are talking about no flows, there may be different security lattices that fit the no flow relationship. I see, I see, yes. Very In a way, nice. It, it helps you. So you don't have to say, this is my security lattice and get stuck to it. No, you just think in terms of no flows. And then, very late in the design, you decide yes. which security lattice to put. I, I see your point. Yes, it, it is a very nice, uh, very nice approach. So you mean that uh, 
from the early stages of uh, the design, you leave many different options exactly. open yes. because until you reach the final state and then you can decide which policy exactly. best fits to your uh, purpose. Okay. Exactly. Yes. So you don't um, have to, to decide early on. on yes. And uh, last question, if I, I can, I'm sorry that <laughs> I did so many questions. Uh, I was thinking uh, in the context of this uh, European project that we are working on, uh, we are very much interested for uh, learning enabled components. And these learning components are basically functions which relate uh, an input to an output. Uh, so uh, within the context of your interface uh, theory, theoretical approach, uh, it may be interesting to see if you can include learning enabled components in these models, component-based models, and then to try to ensure that uh, there are certain non-interference guarantees because when we have interference by other model components, we may have very unpredictable behavior for the learning components. You uh, mean like a shield or a... What, sorry? Like a, a shield? Like a, a... Yes, something like this, yes. So, uh, have you discussed with your supervisor the prospect to extend your work towards this direction? Uh, we didn't discuss this direction. So, right, yeah, I think it's a good direction. I thought about it, actually. But yes. uh, right now, we are really focused on these stress semantics because okay. this is a problem we have right now. Um, yeah. uh, and, and it's something that's changing very quickly. So there was really no good way to specify what we have here. In the last year, there was many hyperlogics uh, mm -hmm. appearing <laughs> that can do some work. So maybe you can look at this notion of asynchronous hyperproperties. There was, I know, five papers in the last year and a half. So it's very, uh, it's growing really fast. And we hope that with these asynchronous hyperproperties, we may be able to have these trace semantics. And once we have, I believe, trace semantics, a lot of interesting things come up. Like, can we do shielding? Can we do synthesis? Can we do monitoring? Okay. You see, so. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Good luck with the continuity of your work. Thanks. Maybe just to add uh, on this thought, uh, by the way, Panayotis, thanks a lot for these questions. They are very inspiring. Yeah, uh, so, uh, I think with the learning enabled components, uh, uh, the nice thing how this can this work can be combined is that uh, uh, this uh, uh, interface uh, theories, uh, uh, they have this very a nice top-down design flavor often. And uh, one can use uh, to starting from like uh, your system level properties, like uh, you have some ideas, uh, what is the kind of information that you don't want to flow? Uh, you could derive uh, uh, what is actually uh, the, the property that uh, your uh, learning enabled component must satisfy the norm. Right. Yeah, and, right. Uh, and this then becomes like uh, you use it to derive what what are the requirements on your right. learning enabled right. component. Th th this was my, my idea. In fact, yeah. uh, we have uh, already done some work together with uh, Stavros Tripakis on how to prove uh, the equivalence between learning components. We have considered various kinds of uh, criteria, uh, for example, distance matrix for the learning component or arc max and so on. But uh, one thing that uh, I find a very interesting prospect is to, to be able to prove equivalence of uh, two different neural networks with respect to some input-output relationship. I mean, how to integrate them to to the systems model. Yes, yes, yes. In order to preserve uh, safety, non-interference, I don't want. To, I don't know what other system level properties are interest, interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions for Anna? 
if not, uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, Anna again for, for joining uh, our, uh, our workshop, our meeting, and for presenting uh, uh, her work to, to this audience. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for your attention and thanks again, Anna, for presenting this uh, work. Thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy actually to share it. <laughs> Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.